Good afternoon. Hello. So I had a, an introduction, and we had to get the, uh, the pointer here. But um, anybody that's staying, please welcome. Anybody that's leaving, I guess there's exits. Um, my name is Jeff Abbott, and I'm with Global Scaling Academy. And we're really excited to be here today in Copenhagen, um, among other things, to announce our strategic partnership with one of Denmark's most exciting companies, Valuer. Um, but first, I was asked to talk about blitzscaling in the Nordics. Um, how many of you have heard the word blitzscaling? Just see a quick show of hands. Okay, and how many currently would say they have a, a good understanding of that or a favorable impression of that in terms of what it means? And how many would say that right now they don't necessarily understand it or they have a, a degree of indifference or aren't really sure how applicable that is to Europe or the Nordics? Okay, that's what I was expecting to hear. So I'm definitely uh, prepared to have a conversation with you. Um, the first thing is, um, definitely didn't come over here from Silicon Valley to say that what works there works here. So I really want this to be a conversation. Um, this may or may not be the best format to have a conversation, but if somebody has a, a strong question that they want to address, by all means, um, don't hesitate to stand up and ask it, um, because we really want this to be interactive. So um, pictured on the, uh, the first slide are um, my partners, Reed Hoffman and Chris Ye, who authored the book. Um, Chris was unable to be here today, so you got stuck with me. Unfortunately, he tore his Achilles tendon playing basketball. And anyway, sends his regards, and, and I'm sure we'll see him next time. Um, we created Global Scaling Academy essentially to introduce blitzscaling as a framework. Not as a story, not as hype, not as what a few companies can do, um, but nobody else can do unless you can raise millions of dollars and your Facebook, right? So I'm here today to talk to you about how blitzscaling is a framework and a tool, just like any other framework or tool that you might have learned in business school, that can help you think about how scalable your business model is fundamentally, whether you're starting or whether you're a very large corporation trying to find the next source of growth or trying to understand which startups to partner with internally, what are the characteristics of a business model that are fundamentally scalable? And what are the management techniques necessary to grow from stage to stage? So it's in that context today that I would like to talk about blitzscaling. And at the end, I will address several of the misperceptions about what blitzscaling is that are currently in the media, and I would say particularly in the European media. So Chris and Reed wrote this book as a, a retrospective, right? So if they were musicians, this would be looking back over 20 years before them and picking out a playlist of the greatest hits, the things that had worked the best for the most iconic companies. And they talked to at least 100 um, different founders. There was a class taught at Stanford in the fall of 2015 where Reed, uh, Alan Blue, John Lilly, and Chris Ye taught the course, and they invited in dozens of well-known founders to tell their story. That's on YouTube now. That's four years ago. And that was all part of the research. Um, and so this book took about five years to write, um, and it really is reflective of the insider tales, right? So it's meant to be a toolkit, even though it's told like a story. The secret of Silicon Valley on the previous slide is that there really are many startup hubs. And if you look around the world, there's more and more early stage venture capital. There's more and more um, accelerator programs. The world of venture capital and startups is democratizing. And this is a wonderful thing. Everybody's delighted about this. Um, we want to help other people understand how this methodology could work for them right where they are. So we're definitely trying to support local ecosystems and help companies scale right where they are. Definitely not here to try to say to everyone, you need to go to Silicon Valley. But the characteristics of Silicon Valley are such that in a place that only has 4 million people, um, somehow more than half of the technology unicorns that have been produced in the last 20 years are coming from this very small place. And so the secret isn't that Silicon Valley is great at starting, because now everybody's good at starting. The secret is that somehow they figured out how to scale. And 
do so repeatedly. And there's a common understanding between investors and entrepreneurs about why one should want to do this, what the capabilities of a team are, what the characteristics of a business model are, that allows them to short circuit a lot of this conversation that gets stuck right now between many early stage startups and investors who haven't had the opportunity to witness this kind of growth. So in a sense, there's an investor education and a startup education piece contained in this. Um, so we're talking about the lessons of Silicon Valley as a scaling hub. So the definition in the book is that blitzscaling is the pursuit of rapid growth by prioritizing speed over efficiency in the state of uncertainty. Now that sounds really simple, um, but it's not a reckless gamble. Um, the purpose of blitzscaling is to achieve enduring market leadership. It's a Glen Gary, Glen Ross market. And I don't know if any of you remember that old movie from the 90s with Alec Baldwin, um, where he says, always be closing, right? It's, it's an old movie. But the basic idea is that in a winner-takes-all market or in a winner-takes-most market, like let's say ride-sharing, right, where Uber starts out in the United States but quickly regional competitors drop up, right? And, and by the time they start growing, it may be too late for Uber to come into their markets, right? So there really are winner-take-most or winner-take-all dynamics in some of these markets. If you believe you're in one of those markets, then the risk, the cost of not getting there first and not locking that market in is so high, the cost of that is so high that you're willing to overspend, you're willing to prioritize speed over efficiency and burn some capital in the short term because you believe that getting there and staying there allows you to make money with virtually no competition for 20 years, like Facebook or Google or Amazon has been doing, right? So it's a classic Glengarry Glen Ross market where the first prize, anybody remember in the movie what the first prize was? It was, yeah, a Cadillac, right? So it was some salespeople competing and the first prize in the office if you were the best salesman was you won the Cadillac. The second prize was you got a set of steak knives. And I don't know about you, but you know, probably got more steak knives than I know what to do with. In other words, it's not really a second prize that anybody cares about. Second place isn't worth having in one of these markets because it, it, it basically means you lost out on the big opportunity. Um, and third prize in the movie was you're fired, right? So there really isn't a third prize. This is, this is when it's a winner-take-all dynamic. So the first point I want to make is not all of us are in these kind of markets, right? Not all of us are trying to blitz scale or should blitz scale. But the question is, let's go back and just like people still read The Art of War by Sun Tzu 2,000 years later and find that the smart general was the one that learned how to win the war without ever fighting it. Is there a way to design a business model that has all of the right characteristics early on consciously? instead of getting to the point where you're trying to raise a Series A and you still haven't thought about these things. That's what we're trying to talk about here. So when should I blitz scale? You should blitz scale when you have a really, really big, potentially massive global market. And when you believe there is an enduring long-term advantage to being the first mover at scale. You should blitz scale if you have access to massive distribution. Massive distribution allows you to grow through your customers, through your partners, so that you're not hiring one salesperson for every customer, so that you're not literally banging the phones and, and you can't grow without adding headcount. A classic blitz scaling curve is one where the revenue curve eventually outstrips the cost and the headcount curve because the business starts to kick in. It's usually a business that has high gross margins because, of course, you may want to raise a lot of capital to get to the point where you've locked in and you've achieved this competitive advantage. But if you continue to per perpetually require these injections of capital, then there's no payback. There's no payback for you as founders and there's no payback for your investors. And so you want a higher margin business so that you can fund your own growth. And eventually when you've achieved that plateau and you stop blitz scaling, that you're sitting on a high margin business that will make attractive rents to make it worth everyone's effort. 
you want a business that has network effects. And network effects are the moat around your castle. I was thinking about them when I went out to Fredericksburg Castle a couple weekends ago and saw this beautiful castle with the bridge and the classic medieval moat that nobody can get across. If you're inside that space, it's very hard for somebody to overtake your competitive position, which is why castles were always built around moats and up on hills. Same thing with a network effect. They, they give you something that is very hard to take away from you. And finally, um, you want to avoid um, falling into the trap of several of the growth limiters. So a growth limiter could be lack of product market fit. Um, how many people remember Groupon? Did anybody ever buy a Groupon? Okay, what about in the last year? Okay, last two years. Yeah. So this was the world's fastest growing company. This was the hottest thing in Silicon Valley six or eight years ago. But Groupon forgot a very important thing. They grew, 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 but they didn't have product market fit. And so after a couple times of using Groupon, their customers started to fall off. They just kept getting new customers and they expanded internationally and they kept burning, but they never retained anyone. And so now they're worth 1% of what they could have been worth. They tried to go back and fix the problem later, but by then it was too late. So that's a perfect example of a blitz scaling company that can blitz fail because of one of the growth limiters. And the final one is the lack of operational scalability, which refers to your team, uh, the capabilities of your executives, your ability to scale the infrastructure. And so if, if you score highly on the, the four growth factors and you can avoid falling into the trap of the two growth limiters, you may have a case for blitzscaling. The other reason you might want to blitzscale is because you have a competitor and they could stop you from attaining this position of first mover at scale and they have started to blitzscale. Classic example, Airbnb. They started out, they were growing fast in the United States, but they weren't blitzscaling until Rocket Internet in Berlin came along and said, we can copy this business model in Europe. And they quickly raised $300 million, opened 15 offices, hired a lot of people, and replicated this business very quickly. And then about a year later, they went to Airbnb and said, you can have our business in Europe for 25% of your company. Now, that feels like extortion. And that's exactly how the founders felt. They felt, you know, we're the ones that had the dream. This was, this was our idea. This is our passion. We really want to be the global leader in travel. These guys don't even care. They don't want to run the business. They just want to get some quick money. So they doubled down and they decided to blitz scale. And they went and raised a fortune. And they doubled their offices. They opened in Europe. And eventually we know that, that they won. Um, so there's blitz scaling as a proactive strategic choice. And there's blitz scaling in response to competition because again, you don't want those steak knives. Your grandmother's going to give you a set anyway, so don't, don't compete for a new set. Um, so we believe that the future uh, can and should be better than the past. Um, if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which I know are very close to the heart of the folks in the Nordics, I'm, I'm in great admiration about the degree to which societies here have, have embraced the importance of this and are really leading the way. One of the things that the Sustainable Development Goal says is that we need, um, I think it's 600 million new jobs in the world by 2030. So what's the most efficient way to create those jobs and to solve the problems that people are trying to solve in the world? Is it um, 60,000 companies that one in every small city that each one does the same thing, replicating the time of local resources, uh, taking you know, small, non-scalable businesses, but just doing the same thing everywhere? Or would we be better off with 6,000 new global corporations that have 10,000 employees and are able to create efficient supply chains and efficiently solve problems globally? Um, we believe it's the latter, and we believe that that's the way that a technology-enabled economy tends to want things to go. Um, in other words, we believe that if Jeff Bezos hadn't built Amazon, someone else would have, that it's just inevitable. So blitzscaling is a response to market dynamics. It's not the cause of them. Somebody would have built Amazon. 
It's a strategic technique for moving faster. It's not a reckless gamble. It's not something irresponsible. And there are examples of things that are useless um, and that have questionable societal value. Like you might suggest the scooters out on the street. Who knows where that's going? Um, you don't get to choose whether you have competition. You just get to choose whether you play to win. And so the question, and I'm going to direct this now to the, the topic of blitzscaling in the Nordics. And um, I've been to every, every Nordic country um, that participates, for example, in the, the Nordic Innovation Program, except Iceland. So I've been to Oslo, uh, Stockholm, Helsinki, Copenhagen quite a number of times, Amsterdam, Estonia. Um, and the same questions have come up over and over again, which is, um, can this work here? And people will bring up, and I, I don't remember the exact term for it, it's, it's almost the same term in every language, and that's why I can't, um, I can't recall it, but um, will this work here because we believe so much in equality, because it's not good to be flashy or to be too successful or, you know, to, ha to be too ambitious. Um, the way we do business, we want to make sure that everyone wins and society wins. And I think there's something inherent about this term or inherent about the way maybe people think about Silicon Valley that is so um, rude and capitalistic and aggressive and, and, you know, maybe brings to mind thoughts of, you know, creating inequality and, and leaving people unattended to. And um, that is absolutely not the vision of, of blitzscaling um, that Chris and Reed are, are trying to promote at all. In fact, um, we believe that you can and should responsibly blitzscale um, and that there's a way to do that. Um, and, and so, again, it's, it's part of it is, can this work here? Um, absolutely. Um, and so the question is, how do you get companies to move from one stage to the next? Blitzscaling is not something that everyone should do. Um, it is a strategic choice or a response to competition. Blitzscaling is relative to your industry, relative to your, uh, your region, relative to your competition, right? So it's not, it's not something that you just do for no reason, right? It's, it's a very well-studied decision. Many um, research studies have shown that as people pass through these stages, from family, um, a small startup, to say, a Series A company, that almost everything changes. Um, you go from an informal culture where everyone knows each other to slightly more process-driven, but with 100 people, the founders still know everybody. By the time you get to 500 people, it's kind of hard to know everybody and feel like you have a tight relationship. So you start to have to have processes and internal communications. Something really interesting that Chris shared that came out of the research was almost every one of these founders that they talked to said that they had been personally involved in the, f the hiring of the first 500 people in their company. That that's so important what the culture was that they hired people knowing that they were hiring those people's networks. So the point of networks is really important here because of course you can start a company here and have global ambition and you can network right from here, thanks to all the technology, right? We have, how am I doing on time? Am I done? You're done. I'm done. All right, <laughs> give, me, give me a couple seconds to finish. How much time do I really have? You can have a couple of seconds. A couple of seconds. All right. So I think it's a question of, um, you know, of ambition design. The, the question is, you have to be fast today just to stay afloat. Um, but are you, are you trying to outrun your neighbor? or are you trying to train for an Olympic gold medal, right? And the latter is always a choice. And, and I think blitzscaling is a similar kind of choice. If, if you're willing to go after a global market and, and want to build something, you're going to overturn every stone. You're going to find the best trainer. You're going to do things differently. There has been pushback. Um, I acknowledge it. And I think it's largely misunderstood. Um, for example, WeWork is in the news today. If you went back and did an analysis of WeWork using the variables that I described, and this presentation is available later for sharing, what you would find is that WeWork probably did blitz scale. They raised a lot of money. They're falling under criticism now because their profits haven't materialized. 
But if you had used the blitzscaling framework to analyze their business model, you would have realized that they're in the commercial real estate business where the margins are about 3%. And no matter how big your business is, if you have 3% margins, you don't have a sustainably scalable business, right? So sure, it's okay that they blitzscale, but if they want to stay afloat, they're obviously going to have to make changes to their business model and introduce some things um, that create additional operating margin and, and so forth. Had you been running a business like that and used the blitzscaling framework to think about in advance, you might have chosen not to blitzscale until you had addressed those problems. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I look forward to talking to you all later. Amazing. Feel free to stay.